And you can't do that without a flexible monetary base. Um, so it's not just fiscal, because if you had fiscal, but if you had just had a inflexible monetary base, it doesn't matter because it would still collapse towards it. The bonds would default even at the at the sovereign level. But the combination of the fiscal and the flexible monetary base is how they have this permanently expansive system. In this analysis, Lynn Alden delves into the complex world of money creation, exploring historical parallels and the changing landscape of fiscal and monetary policies. She emphasizes the fractured reserve system, distinguishing between base and borrowed money. Alden shares lessons from the Great Depression, stressing the need for a flexible monetary base to prevent systemic collapses. Global examples, including Germany's quick response during a crisis, underscore Alden's argument for a blend of fiscal measures and a flexible monetary base for a sustainable expansion. Contrasting with other countries, she links unique household debt bubbles to stock market depth. Alden highlights red flags for the U.S. economy, significant sovereign debt, fiscal deficits, and a worrisome trade deficit. Unlike Japan, the U.S. lacks a financial cushion. These factors, combined with structural issues, suggest a potential shift towards a more inflationary environment, posing a significant risk. Let's dive into the clip. Also, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and drop your comments below. So I think it's both, um, and different eras have different priorities. So for example, in the 1940s and the 2020s, most of the money creation, like the extra money creation was from large monetized fiscal deficits. The 70s were different, which was that we still had deficits, but most of the money creation was from bank lending. The way I would describe it is that we have a fractured reserve system, which means that money is lent into existence. Um, and so you have two tiers of money. There's base money and broad money. And broad money is just an, a fractured reserve IOU for base money. And the challenge is that during periods of credit expansion, more and more broad money, the ratio of broad money grows compared to base money. And eventually you run into a massive crisis when this happens. If you drive interest rates all the way to zero, you drive debt higher and higher. When we get to zero or even some kind of, sometimes slightly below zero, there's nowhere to go. And so eventually that starts collapsing. And if you do not expand the base money, if there's if no one can print the base money, then that broad money supply will, will start collapsing down towards the base money. We saw this in the Great Depression, about a third of the M2 uh, broad money was destroyed. Um, and that process was going to keep happening. But then the, the government and the Federal Reserve stepped in and said, you know what, we're going to increase the base money, and we're going to do bank holidays, and we're going to kind of make this money good. And they kind of stabilized it and started growing it from there. A similar thing happened in 2008, where you hit zero, you hit tons of debt, starts collapsing. This time, they, of course, were way faster with the money printers. They come in, they just double the base money supply. They arrest the drop in the broad money supply. And so the way I would phrase it is that, you know, the Fed is not necessarily directing that broad money supply growth during that expansion era. But what they do do is they step in and they help it stop from shrinking. Uh, and so it basically locks in those prior decades of money creation. They say, okay, that's actually now money good. You've, all, the, all the exponential credit you've created, fraction reserved, we're not going to let that collapse. And so it retroactively solidifies that inflation that already occurred. And you can't do that without a flexible monetary base. Um, so it's not just fiscal, because if you had fiscal, but if you had just had an inflexible monetary base, it doesn't matter because it would still collapse towards it. The bonds would default even at the, at the sovereign level. But the combination of the fiscal and the flexible monetary base is how they have this permanently expansive system. So our corporate debt and our household debt are not as high as some other countries. There's a number, number of countries in Europe that have much higher um, uh, household debt because their real estate values are inflated. Different, it's like funny, different countries in the world have different bubbles. So in countries that don't have very deep uh, stock markets, usually their housing markets get bubbled. So Canada, Australia, parts of Europe, in the United States, we have a very robust equity market, private equity, all sorts of things like that. And so our real estate usually does not inflate as much as other places. Instead, it's in the, it's in the capital markets. And that results in lower household debt. I think the biggest issue faced in the U.S. is that in addition to our large debt, uh, sovereign debt and fiscal deficits, we have the um, trade deficit. That, that's what makes us the opposite of Japan. So Japan, although they do have their, their sovereign debt problems, it's somewhat offset by the fact that they've historically run decades of trade surpluses. They build up a very positive net international investment position, tons of reserves. 
So they have a lot of ammo to slow down the decline of their currency, to pay some of their oil bills and things like that. that they, sh they should run into kind of shortages there. They've got this big like uh, stash of acorns they can start, you know, eat in the winter that, that we don't really have. We, a lot of our benefits are more in the present. So our powerful geography, our attractive capital markets, our network effects of the English language and, and you know, economic size. Whereas we don't really build up these sovereign reserves. And so the, com the fact that we're now running very large fiscal debts and deficits and we have a trade deficit is where we start getting into, I think, a more structurally inflationary environment that we've been accustomed to in, in the past couple of decades. And I think that's kind of the, the main risk going forward. In this next segment, Lynn Alden expresses optimism about the future of gold, outlining a persuasive argument for its potential price surge. She highlights a global shift among central banks, diversifying away from heavy reliance on U.S. dollars, favoring assets like gold for their dual qualities of security and quick liquidity. Alden underscores gold's enduring role as a financial safeguard, even in a digital age where disruptions or cyber attacks could limit transactional capabilities. Anticipating a potential fiscal spiral for the U.S. dollar with sizable sovereign debts, Alden predicts an increasing turn to alternative currencies. While acknowledging Bitcoin's emergence, she suggests its current size may limit its sovereign reserve role, positioning gold as one of the most robust global monetary networks. In summary, Lynn Alden positions gold as a resilient and appealing investment, poised to gain value amid evolving economic uncertainties, making it an attractive option for investors seeking stability. I like gold. I'm bullish on gold. Um, uh, when you look at central banks around the world, they don't necessarily want to have all their reserves in the U.S. Um, I mean, also, when you think of a sovereign reserve, there's kind of two parts of it. Um, one hand, you know, no country ever wants to ever draw down its reserve to zero, right? That'd be obviously a very bad. Something terrible has happened if that has happened. So there's basically like their savings account, which they don't need to be as super liquid. Um, they want it to be secure. And then there's the part that they want to be able to buy and sell very quickly, right? They might want to defend their currency. They might want to pay for oil. And, you know. So uh, the, for a long time, a lot of countries would hold all of that in dollars or a big chunk of that in dollars. And I think now a lot of them are saying, okay, we can hold some dollars for a quick you know, transaction we want to do. But for the bulk of it, maybe we want to put that in gold. Or maybe we want to diversify that into a couple of different currencies. Maybe we want to make deals with Brazil to basically have a, a you know, iron... Uh, exposure for the next 10 years. Maybe we want to do kind of these private equity things. These are these less liquid things. And so I think we're seeing more diversification and gold plays an important role there. Uh, you know, gold has often played the role of a insurance against kind of financial catastrophe. Going forward, even if we enter a, a Bitcoin world and digital world, you know, there's never a guarantee that you're always going to have access to the internet. You know, your, your private keys can be stored offline, but your ability to interact and receive you know, send payments and, you know, kind of make verified transactions and things that could be limited. Um, and so I think gold still solves a role for what if the internet gets disrupted? What if there's a cyber attack? What if the power goes out? What if this happens? What if um, kind of true mayhem happens, right? So I think that gold still has a, has a role as a reserve asset, uh, both at the sovereign level and household level. Uh, it just doesn't really solve things at the transactional level. So I, I am, I'm bullish long term. I think that basically as the dollar over the long term enters more of a fiscal spiral type of scenario. We have very large sovereign debts. Um, if you have inflation and in, in from those fiscal deficits, interest rates become a very mixed tool for fighting that because interest rates blow out the deficit even more uh, at these levels. It's, it's not the Volcker area era where you had 30% debt to GDP. And so the challenge is that I think a number of entities are going to seek alternative monies and Bitcoin's still too small to really kind of serve at the sovereign reserve level, especially for large countries. You know, maybe it has to go through a couple more liquidity cycles, get tested a little bit more to see how it's doing. So, uh, you know, gold kind of still stands there as, as one of the strongest monetary networks in the world. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the intricate dynamics of money creation and the potential economic shifts discussed by Lynn Alden. If you found this analysis enlightening, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and ring the notification bell to stay updated on our future finance insights. Do you agree with Lynn Alden's perspectives on the fiscal challenges and the role of gold in these uncertain times? Share your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear your take. For more valuable content on finance, investing, and economic trends, stay tuned.